this video, the middle-aged nerds discuss spoilers from books they read decades ago. Do you really need a spoiler alert? Do you really? Hi, I'm Bill, also known as Matt Stagger. And I'm Glenn the Geeky Hippie. Welcome to Non-Terrestrial Half-Life, the YouTube channel where we reread books that we read in the first half of our life. This week we're continuing with the Empire Trilogy by Jani Wirtz and Raymond E. Feist with Servant in the Empire. But you see we have a returning guest, Nynaeve Sedai. How are you? Welcome Hi, back. Hi, how are you? Delighted I'm to good. be back. How are you? I'm great. Great yeah. to have you back. Lovely to be it's back. Well. So, Bill, we have discovered, hadn't read these books. But because we have a guest who did read them in the first half of their life, it meets the criteria for our channel. That's just so you, if you're wondering why Bill is talking about it as if he had never read it before. Because I never read it before. So, what did everybody think of this book? Loved it. Loved yeah. It. I enjoyed it. I really did. Um, I was surprised to find there were mixed sort of feelings from a lot of the fandom. Um, maybe that's yeah. because I immediately went into this book after the first one. I don't know if that uh, makes a difference, but I was very one. excited yeah. for this book and I was mentally prepared for a romance. I had been warned. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that, that did catch me off guard when I was like 15 or 16 or however old I was when it came out. Because um, I picked this book off the new bookshelf. Um, but I, I, overall, I absolutely loved it. Um, I love the fact that they're subverting a lot of the sort of gender roles in fantasy. Because Kevin is absolutely a manic pixie dream girl. He has one purpose in this book. That is to advance Maya and, uh, you know, have her become a better person and learn from. And then he is whisked away. He is a manic pixie dream girl. And I love the fact that they switched it on us. That's so great. Uh, do you know what? I obviously I'd I'd read these after I'd read the original um magician uh, and uh Richworth trilogy. Um so they were they had been a completely different experience from those, even the style of writing, but this is what I find is you, you start with the first one and then you get into servant and it's just to me I found it was even better than the first one. And you know how sometimes it's so hard to find a trilogy where the second book beats the first one. So yeah. it, I think, and then the third one makes <clears> it <throat> even better than the first two, you know? So, um, but I loved it. I was addicted to it. I couldn't put it down the first time I'd read it. And the first time I reread it this year, it was like a whole new experience. Cause once again, I'd forgotten yeah. so much about it, you know? Um, And I totally get, what Bill means about uh Kevin. So um yeah. which I find really funny. Um but it's 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 very true. So um he's he's a bit of a I can't even it, he, well I'll, yeah <laughs> he, <laughs> can't he's even a bit heavy him. handed with his superiority complex. Um that you know, I don't know. Yeah. I think he was heavy handed just enough because anybody from a civilized culture that goes to the Saranawani Empire really ought to What is civilized uh, 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 though? Uh, uh, that uh, depends uh, on your view. Well, so well, exactly. first and foremost, get rid of what he he objected to the most, the slavery. It, only barbarians have slaves. And that's what I would have said if I was Kevin. Only barbarians without honor have slaves. And then I would have been hung. But, you know. Upside down. Yeah. Yeah. With probably. a fire. Right below but your head. I have a mouth. Yeah. I have a mouth. And, and, and I, 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 I would have complained about everything that Kevin complained about. And that's why I, Kevin is. I never really realized how much I like the character of Kevin. You know. But I was going to say, this is probably one of my favorite trilogies of all time. Uh, one of my favorite series of all time. Um, 
I kind of cheat when I have my list of my top 20 favorite books or series of all time because I have this packed in with all of the rest of the Rift War cycle because several of those other books in there would be on my list. You know, so I clump them all as one. Um, but this is, I I personally think, I think this is the best three entries, well, the first two en entries in the entire cycle, Rift War cycle. I think it's the best stuff Raymond Feist had his hand in writing. And this book is, for me, the yeah. best of the three. Um, I love this book. I I like the I like the third book, but the second book is the one that I really like, and it's I like Kevin, and I just I I enjoyed having a, a a mouthpiece in the story to say exactly what I kept wanting to say. Well, so almost what I wanted to say. He made it through a lot, so he didn't say exactly. That's what he's there for, though. He's he's a tool. He's a writing tool <laughs> to get a moral and a point across. You know what I mean? Instead of having a narrator actually be the one that's being omnipotent and giving yeah. all the opinions and whatnot, they actually use a character to do that. And I think that's brilliant. You know, so everything that they want to vocalize or want to, to say that's wrong. But the, obviously, as, as being the, you know, no, not the main the omnipotent narrator. They use their characters to bring these points across. And I think it just works in the context of the actual storylines for the, the whole series. Um and in in a sporadic, um, you know, there's a lot to be learned, but I think it works really well. I, I I'd agree. Um, I think for the time this came out, which was like what nineteen ninety. I mean, it, it was. It holds up very well. Let's say that. Um, you know, and, and there were several times I was surprised, mostly pleasantly. Uh, one time not so pleasantly, but that you know, it's a minor gripe I have about the story. But we'll get to that. So I was 17 when I read this book, yeah, 1990. Or I turned 17 that year. Wow. I won't tell you what yeah. age it was in 1990. Just saying. Uh, no, <laughs> that's fine. Roll gray hair. So hey, I earned them. Every one of them. How old were you, Neve, when you the first time you read this book? In 1990, I was seven. You read it when this came out? No, no, I didn't no. read it when it came out, but oh. 1997. Oh. I read this about okay. 20 years ago. God, um, I feel old. <laughs> you're 10 years younger than me. That's a lot yeah. of my friends are 10 years younger than me. Matter of fact, uh, half the crew are on uh, what the adaptation. Well, the two women are both 40 years old. So it's a great age. Oh, I'm sure yeah, they're going to love you it. pointing that out, too. Yeah, except you're editing this. <laughs> Which means I'm if leaving it in. in. <laughs> <laughs> you know I will. So how old were you, Neith, when you first Seven. read this? When I oh. first read this, <laughs> I would have been about 20. So it would have been about 20 years okay. ago. Back around the mm -hmm. same time, I would first picked up the Raymond, the original Raymond device book. I was kind of like, where have you been all my life? Um, yeah. So, although there's a lot of it, I really forgot, I'll be honest. Um, but then considering I forgot Thomas and Magician, there's no surprise I forgot <laughs> most of this. <laughs> I forgot all about the trip overseas to Dostari. And this, mm. this month was the last, the fifth and sixth time I've read the books. So I've read them four times before this year. I should have remembered the Dastari campaign, but it just, what? I don't remember. When he got there, I was like, this? Oh, wow. Well, it's yeah. probably been 20 years since I read it. So it has been there a long time go. since I read these books. It's kind of nice so, being the yeah. one to, you know, be reading for the first time. I'm like, I don't have any of those problems. Yay. Which yeah. is great because you've got a fresh perspective as well, rather than looking at it going, oh my God, how did I forget this? How could I forget this character? 
you know, you're you're reading it for the first time and going, oh my god. Yeah, Why and I, I, not... I expected to hate this. I really expected to not like this because I'm not a fan of political intrigue most of the time. And I told Glenn, I'm like, I'm not a big fan of the whole, you know, political machinations. Uh, just it bores me to tears. He's like, trust me, this won't. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. <laughs> and then I read the first book and went, oh, my God, this is great. Yeah, it's it's fantastic because it takes so many different elements out of history. And I think we mentioned the it's last so time we were talking about it. Uh, you can kind of uh, different cultures Japanese Aztec Roman which is what really stood out for me obviously you picked out a Star Trek civilization Klingon, yeah. Klingons, Klingons, Klingons. Um, you did so and you really do see how brilliantly worked together and woven they are and harmoniously so it actually is such a convincing kind of universe and it's very realistic i think in that sense um you could actually imagine that kind of a civilization existing on our own because to be fair there have been very similar civilizations that have existed um yeah. so and yeah, i think just... it's absolute genius how it's been brought to life in such a way that it's gripping you know and Sometimes a lot of books they try to be politically gripping in such a way uh, like that, uh, particularly in fantasy, and it, it just doesn't always work. And it shows almost like a naivety when it comes to politics or or mm. anything to do with that kind of um yeah, the machination. The, no subtlety. So yeah, so in these <laughs> books, they just seem to have have just got just gotten it right. And made made the whole intrigue so fascinating that you can't help but get caught up in in the games that they're playing with each other, you without, know. Without making it complicated. Exactly. It's very yeah. easy to understand. Yeah. It's very easy to follow. You know, it's not very complex. I, I've um, come to the sort of decision that uh I don't dislike political intrigue. I just dislike it when it's not done well. Would Apparently, I haven't been reading the right books because I love this. Um, what did you think of Song I, I of like, Ice and Fire? Eh, there are some successes, but there are some big misses. So okay. it's a mixed bag. Well, when you've read A Song of Ice and Fire, obviously, I haven't. I've only watched the TV series. But when you're reading these books, you can almost see little snippets of it that have been pinched out of the books and put into a song of ice and fire that really stands out to oh, me yeah. now the reader that i hadn't noticed the first time around because obviously i'd never read the other books never right. particularly no, this book first. yeah exactly All i'll the tell you who i'm positive <laughs> has read the empire trilogy or read the had read the empire trilogy it, and i couldn't put my finger on exact reasons why it just it kept going to my head Robert Jordan's read this before, I, all the time. Yeah. Reading the first book and the second book and the third book, Jordan's read yeah. these. He has. He's had. He has to have. Mm -hmm. um, not saying he stole. That... He, he was just. It. It gave him little bits in his mind to work with, and he did other. He did something completely different. But we, we've been through that. He is. The cross pollination is going to happen. There's yeah. nothing yeah. you can do about it. You know, textuality. What, I have to throw all of literature. Yeah, but it's I mean, what, what you little... consume, you're going to yeah. touch on. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I don't think it's fair to point out at anybody and say, "Oh, they stole it." It's like, ah, that's not how no, it I works. The, I, the I aspects of the, no, no, just in general, because we do get yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, this People is just a rip that. off of, and it's like, no, it's more subtle. Everything's than that. a rip off of Shakespeare, yeah. so. Everything sent Shakespeare is a rip off of Shakespeare, well, so screw it. Everybody. Shakespeare was a rip off of the oral tales that were told around the fire. Right. So, yeah, and other people's work as well. We can't uh, forget about that. Kind yeah. of Romeo and Juliet was written by somebody else previously, if I remember correctly. I could could be getting that one wrong. As far as I know, I, someone I, else I know has there written was, the story before. I know there was something like Hamlet before Hamlet, I think, but I could be well, wrong. That's, I think Hamlet's well, the one that he I based heard. Based on real people, 
Yeah, so Hamlet has, there's a lot of people in Hamlet that are actually based on actual people who existed in Denmark. If you've ever seen uh, Who Do You Think You Are, the genealogy TV show, uh, yeah. Judy Dench mm. does her her ancestry, and she's actually related to, uh, in, one of her ancestors is either Rosencrantz or Guildenstern, so, nice. uh, which is phenomenal. Or so. horrible, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, but you know, as an Shakespearean actress, she found it so you know profound that she actually had this real genetic link to Shakespeare in a sense. What are your memories, Nynaeve, today, of reading this book the first time? Did it stand out much from the other, it other did. than the politics side? The writing style, you can tell that it's not just Raymond E. Feist involved in the actual writing um, because it's, I know we brought it up when we were talking about Magician that at times he's very automated with his style of writing, like with, mm. um, do -do -do, do -do -do. Da, da, da. whereas this yeah. is such a beautiful flow to the language and everything just feels so beautifully written words selected and it's it's like a tapestry of language and I think that's what makes it so beautiful and it kind of sticks in your head is as you're reading it you can really it's just it's story just comes to life in your mind because it's easier for you to visualize it um as a real tale go ahead because it's just so beautifully written and that i think is something that i'd remembered from the first time i read them and when i started re when i started to reread at the beginning of the year i remembered and just was like overwhelmed it's just like just this beautiful sensation reading um and again, this month when I did the reread re re in ahead ahead of this, um, I was just delighted. I got completely swept away by mm -hmm. the story again because the language grabs you and tugs you and sucks you right in, you know. So, yeah, better. I, I, <laughs> Sorry. I was extremely happy to have some some strong, competent female characters. My biggest complaint with the first trilogy was there's like zero well-written female characters. I mean, we had a couple of cardboard cutouts is what it felt like. They yeah. didn't really have any autonomy in the first trilogy. So this was an yeah. awesome surprise. And I am and loving we... Mara and everything about her. She's fantastic. She's absolutely just one of the best female it... characters ever written in my oh, own yeah. opinion I th yeah i think phenomenal. she is the best fantasy female character that i've read at least within the she's last just, 20 years at least she's yeah. very like was... three-dimensional she's she's a very rounded character she's she's complex she's got like, like positives and and negatives and you can feel mm -hmm. each element of her personality you get to feel her like she's an actual human being rather than as you said the cardboard cardboard cutouts of the likes of Caroline and Magician which I yeah. believe we discussed the last time around as well mm -hmm. so yeah I've been saying for a long time and Bill's heard me say this and I'm sure some of you out there have heard me say too that Mara of the Acoma is the most badass female character that is not you know and she does it without magic and without being a badass warrior you know herself without actually being a warrior herself she is probably beyond any character, any female character that I've read, except for one, Nynaeve Sedai. Nynaeve is the only female character that... It, it, they, nah, they're, I gotta it disagree. depends on the mood. It depends on my mood. Don't Nynaeve isn't you know, nearly as self-aware as Maya is. No, I She's love not. Nynaeve for yeah, obvious reasons. She's right. my name. <laughs> I my name is based on her. I loved her, but she's nowhere near as complex oh, and as Nynaeve. human 
as Myra. Agreed. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd put it a dirty. <laughs> Well, I, I don't. Um, I think it's safe to say that that Nynaeve tends to hide behind um, some of her own inner ignorance sometimes on purpose to not yeah, face things, seen, especially about herself. And uh, Aya doesn't. She, when she makes a mistake, she owns it. And that's one of the things I love about the character. The first time you read this book, and I'll go first mm -hmm. on this, who was your favorite character and why? And has your recent reread changed your perspectives on this character and how so? Mine, I'm not, e I, Mara's too easy to, to pick. I, I'm going to say that uh, she, for me, I'm not going to pick her because she's too obvious. I'm going to go with Arakasi. Oh, uh, agreed. Same. What did I tell Arakasi. <laughs> I, I want to say Kevin. I love Kevin, but Arakasi no. is just. You know, I like the rogue style characters, you know, and if you were to make Arakasi as a D&D &D character, you would have to pick a rogue class to do what he does, you know. Or yeah, close, arcane you trickster know. would work. Just saying. Okay. That, that, that's still maybe not a rogue, but it, it, it's a roguish attitude class. That's for sure. No, in D&D &D terms, he would, but in D&D &D terms, he would be a rogue character. Yeah. Most likely. Um, so, and subclass. that's subclass. that's my palm shot. I love I love the rogue types. So yeah, he's my pick. Um, not that I've read it before, but I told you before this started, um, we must protect Arakasi at all costs. If anything happens to him, I yeah. will murder everyone. That's how I feel. <laughs> so that's my answer. Anything happens to him, I will kill everyone. Yeah, my my answer. Figuratively, I not literally. I right. obviously Mara, but and I also said, but Arakasi needs an honorable mention. He's so brilliant because he yeah. is. He is just fantastic. He's a chameleon, like, and he's a good, kind-hearted chameleon. I mean, think of all the yeah. things he does, and he just shows up one minute as a as a vegetable vegetable seller, next minute he's a guard. You know. You don't even, he blends so well into every environment and he's such a brilliant actor. Now I'm picturing the cabbage like guy from Avatar. The last I ever been. <laughs> there is no war in Bossing Ar Say. Arakasi is probably the single hardest character to cast for oh. this potential Rift War Cycle TV show. Yeah. That's in the works. The one but thing I'm, I can say is I think he should look, in my head, he looks Middle Eastern. Do you know what? I agree. I think he looks more I Indian totally in my agree. head. Very, yeah, I could see that too. Almost Gandhi-like, but a little bit younger. Middle Eastern or thin. Southeast Asian, I think he'd be a toss between Either or, See, well, either way, I think he would the, just be fantastic. But he needs to be I someone think who can be very the, autonomous. Hmm. I, I've thought about how I would cast you. Know, not so much who, but like ethnic types for the different group, you know, groupings around uh, in, in the story. The five great houses, because they were all descended from five brothers, they should all be the same ethnotype. You mm -hmm. know, ha have a similar appearance. I think the Akoma and the Shinzawai should be similar to them as well. And I would go like an East Asian for those seven families. Um, and by, 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 you know, by blood, then a lot of the, what's the Hanada or Honda or the, the clan that the, that the, um, uh, the Akoma are in. Yeah, the clan. clan, the clan. Clan yeah. Adama and most of Clan Kanzawai would be East, Far East Asian. Yeah. But then I would have the, Feist made a point in the Rift War trilogy that the Sorani had every coloration that mid had. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have dark skin, tight curly hair, African look. You're going to have blonde hair, nor, you know, Northern Europe look. You know, you're going to have everything all over in trying to pick 
who would get what, you know, you know, who you would cast as what. It, it, it's something that I've been trying to think of for weeks now. Well, months off and on since they announced that this was going to be made into a show. Honestly, I don't care as long as the actors are top notch and they can pull off the characters. I really don't care. They don't have to be a cohesive look for the families. I'm fine if they don't, but they have got to have the chops to make me believe they are who they are. As long as they can do that, I don't care. They just have to be exceptional actors and convincing yeah. actors. That's all I need. Be yeah. be good at be good at your character, and I'm we're good. Yeah, the best for the role. End of not fitting and, and any. And Max. Just nobody over world. five foot ten. Nobody over no. five ten. <laughs> he hates They're tall people. Short. Maybe they should be Irish. Well, no, they They're are all, all specifically <laughs> short. They are all short, and, and Kevin's yeah, like I'm... shoulders, of, shoulder and head above everybody else. Mm. I know, you but know? you do hate tall people, and that has been our running gag hate... for weeks now. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, know. I will always pick on the uh, on the height of somebody. Yeah. Don't worry, I'm tiny. Can't hate me. I'm I short. Still... Neve, so who was yours on you, when, when you first read, and who is it on this reread? Favorite character? Once again, well, obviously Mara. I just adore her. I think she's fantastic. Um, Did I already ask that? Yeah, Did but I Nikoya, pass it to you? Oh. Nikoya is also brilliant. Nikoya deserves a mention for being, being such a mm. crabbed old granny type character who just bosses her, you know, Mara around, treats her like she's still a little kid. For I love her and Kevin. Help. Yeah, her and Kevin, yeah. she's got one on either side, you know? Um, so I think she deserves a good mention. Nikoya is um, awesome. Yeah, she's brilliant. You don't yeah. see enough, you know, old women characters in f fantasy and science fiction, in my opinion. We had the one in uh, the Earthsea trilogy. Well, Lenny in The Wheel of Time. Okay, yeah, Lin Lenny, yeah. But and her Lenny <laughs> that's and then three, there, that, that's summoning Game of Thrones, wasn't there? Old man, but as I'm thinking as a major character. No, no, uh, no. There. Um, oh, the Queen of Thorns. Yeah, eh, I wouldn't call her a major character. At least, not in the books. At this, she isn't that that much in that much. But she's another if you want to count her. But. Yeah. I'm gonna counter because I mean, she was still... badass and awesome in the show. When you kill, when you yes, kill she, she fucking kicked ass. Excuse my language. No, That's no, fine. you're we, fine. We, we've we, we've given up on our rule. Oh, That's yeah, the no. first time we I fucking swear. <laughs> she was brilliant. We don't say I fuck a lot. Yeah. And, but still, I mean, that's only four, and you know, four or five. That you know, a handful. And how much fantasy and science fiction is there out there? There's like There's hundreds of thousands of titles. Hundreds of thousands of to... titles. And can't think you don't find no. granny even... in science fiction and fantasy. I don't even think there's anything in, a tr in Trudy Canavan books. They're all young, youthful, except for older male characters, like old male yeah. characters. There's no old female characters. What things, if any, had you forgotten since? Well, let's see. Yeah, what did, things, if any, had you forgotten since you first read this book that pleasantly surprised you when you reread it? Oh my God! Literally everything. everything. <laughs> literally everything. Literally. Um, uh oh. I have a head like this. <laughs> I, God, everything. Oh, the best one, best thing remembering for me was the Empire or. The, Empire, Imperial Games. Um, I'd completely Oof. forgotten that even came up in the book. So when that when it was starting to come to, it, I was like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" Yeah, <laughs> well, Lambert's yeah. about to do it. A, a decade before, well, a few, well, quite a while before George R. R. Martin started doing the same scenes from different POVs, we got this in different books, two different books. Yep. We got the same scene. And this felt yeah. more visceral. Just, it this does. one you felt it. Yeah. Oh my god! You're yeah. reading it or listening to it, your the hairs are oh, you're you're feeling I, the the crawling on the back of your neck and the tension and the the the, the atmosphere in this telling 
of the Imperial Games compared to in Magician is out of this world because Dare you're I... seeing it from the innocent people's perspective, the people who were just there at the games, the ones who ended up, a lot of them who ended up suffering because Melander blew his, you know, top basically. Blues. Yeah. So Not without see... reason. Not, Not without, without reason. reason. Obviously, I... he has reasons. But he I, still... I think he let the wrong people, he punished the wrong people, I think. But yeah, I don't think it was a punishment so much as a judgment. It was very and, much, and a judgment. I think yeah. there's a difference. It was biblical judgment, yeah. you know. It felt here. biblical in this book, Imagine. Yeah. It just didn't feel as destructive <laughs> in this dare, one. I'm like, dare we wow. say it's because this was better written because there's a better writer yes. writing this scene? I think yeah, we can I agree that both Feist and, and Works are better writers now. In the first trilogy, period. Yeah, yeah. I, I love can, Raymond E. Feist, so. but I, I really do think he, Janny Wirtz is the better writer in, in parts of this book. Yeah, I don't know who wrote what, so I can't was, say. Yeah, and watch, it turns out we find out at some point, nope, nope, Ray wrote that, Ray wrote that, all that. It was yeah. Like, really? Wow, he did get better then. So who knows? Yeah, we could be it, completely off base. It, it's but, yeah. just, oh, yeah. The, spine the arena tingling. was just. It's the, very the, visceral. The games were just. You could feel what? that fire coming down out of that sky and hitting your skin and burning you. That was how brilliantly it was written, in my honest opinion. No, I mean, the tension before it happened too. Mm -hmm. The build up, the atmospheric build up was just on because point. I used to think, for some reason, I, I, I had it in my head that everything that happened over, over the next couple chapters in the book, while they were still in Kentosani, was like within a day or so of that. And it, and it wasn't until my recent reread, the one I finished today, so reread number two for the year that I realized, oh, that I, I had totally missed one sentence saying like over the next few weeks or something like that. So it was mm -hmm. a longer period of time, but I used to have it in my head that the games happen, everybody flees. And that night they start, it was the night of the bloody night swords, you know, when everybody started getting attacked, there's a whole bunch of time there that I somehow, I always kept blanking out or, you know, in my memory, and earlier the couple months ago when I read it, a month ago when I read it, I must have just, I must have dozed off or something at that point when, you know, because literally until last night, this morning, I thought the two things were so much more connected because, the, and it was, I thought it was a direct connection that it happened right after the games. It's a result right. of the games. Yeah, it is. Um, it's not immediate though. It it stews yeah. for a little bit while people try and figure out what are we gonna do, how do we yeah. move on from here. So But then you kind of get to the the brut the brutality of the scenes in the actual Imperial Palace and the oh. uh, you know, and you kind of feel like what happened at the Imperial Games was actually justified because they're absolutely barbaric to each other. You know, and it seems at times that Mara is the only humane one out of a lot of them. Um, the only one who's like, well, although she sees things from how she might gain politically, she also sees things humanely. And like, I, you know, she finds out through Arakasi that um, one of the other um, houses are about to get attacked that night. And she could have let them get attacked for uh, but she doesn't she she does see well how could I benefit from this but she also sees she can't let it happen she needs to let them know and she needs mm -hmm. to let them um Picanu's, uh clan right yeah no, I, I, so and and no, not, she not, feels not that she needs was... to protect them um uh, not Hakanu, no or it was the um, not the or something there's yeah, I know the Zakatekas end up with 
her one night along with the other guy who was a bit crap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> was there she two just or, saved was there two life. or three? Well, um, it wasn't even so much she; it was he. You know, I can't stand yeah. having the idea. I can't abide by that that slave holding a weapon. I think yeah. you're talking about the like, weapon that saved your anything. life. <laughs> Lucia, like if he I wasn't, didn't... you'd be dead. So <laughs> exactly. get over it. A goddamn slave and his ethicness. You'd be, you'd be like, I don't know, a pink cushion right now. You know, my but, Jojo uh, writing was... badass, Kevin. It, it, it... Yeah, I mean, Kevin is just <laughs> awesome because tw you know all these fights that he's in, where he saves, you know, he he comes out alive. He fought unarmored, even one time in a just a loincloth. Yeah. You know, wearing nothing but a loincloth. Yeah, he got cut up, but he, he survived it. You know, and it's just, the guy's a badass. There's a I, lot of badass characters. But on the can, we, side. Can, can we agree, though, that there is a really heavy feeling of Shogun oh, to yeah. this particular book? Just yeah, it, 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 have you seen Shogun or read Shogun? Any? No. Are you familiar with Shogun? Are you familiar I, with the, with yeah, the miniseries though in the book? I've never watched. No, I've, I I have heard uh, of uh, it, but wouldn't yeah, really know a, it. A British <laughs> ship, a British ship washes ashore in Japan in like the sixteen something, yeah, sixteen hundreds or something. Um, and I think it's Richard Chamberlain. Played, no, was it? Might have been Richard Chamberlain played the character um, that, that, that gets sort of brought into the court of these different samurai. And so you, it's a very similar, you know, Kevin is the Richard Chamberlain or whoever character. Obviously. Yeah. And it probably um, inspired us. Something. Yeah. Basically it, Tom Cruise in The Last Samurai. Sort of. Oh, God. Oof. Yeah, really? sort of. Just a few hours of my life on the get back. <laughs> I, I don't think I've seen that movie. I think I've seen a couple scenes, don't, but that's about it. Don't don't, don't watch it. <laughs> what I had forgotten, why well, I, 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 the stuff I had forgotten, um, the Distari campaign, I, I completely had forgotten. Um, I had forgotten about the plot specifically to kill Kaoki, that, that he was targeted. I had forgotten he was targeted. I forgot. And I I forgot, and Bill and I talked about this thing that they did um, earlier. Um, I had forgotten that they had the Minwanabi or Minwanabi be uh, uh, bent, is Kevin's word, um, twisted, wrong, you know, they, they've got that lust for blood and killing you know well see that that was I the one thing they're all joffrey Baratheon. yeah that was the one thing i kind of didn't enjoy because i had in my head that they were machiavellian you know they they were cerebral assassins they they were all about the 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 game of councils and, and you know using subterfuge and subtle things here and there and then in the end it turns out they're basically mustache twirling villains and i'm like no oh. it's kind of a letdown i mean yeah I think so. a little bit i mean you know i i first half of the book i'm like okay Teseo is a real threat and by the end i'm like this guy is one of the three stooges what is going on yeah and i'm like did she just outplay him that well or and in the end i came to yeah she did And the I'd fact, say, the other thing I'd go ahead. No, yeah. I was just about to say, I think with um, the Minwanabi, you kind of do see a lot of influence of them going to the likes of or our J.R.R. Or Martin's um, Song of Ice and Fire between uh, Joffrey Baratheon and Ramsay Bolton um, with the cruel, yeah. sadistic, awful kind of behavior, except I. I could almost say that Martin might have done it slightly better um, because they do kind of come across as a little flat. I think this is one area in the whole novel 
where I think the character, the, the, the villainous characters are just not what they <coughs> probably could be. They're, their potentials not po- properly lived up to. Um, and their characterization is very two-dimensional. They're not given enough the same kind of um, roundedness as any of the other characters. Mm-hmm. And I think it would have been more effective if, for example, the villains of the story had been just as rounded as Mara had, because then it would have been really, really balanced. But then they're there just for the purpose. And they're yeah. very um, caricatures was... of, of, char- of, you know, villains. They're caricatures, the idiotic um, big guy who likes his wine and his food and sex and all that and doesn't pay attention and has a, um, a vicious temper and Desio and then Taseo who thinks he's better than everybody else. He's a great... Pardon? You almost sound like you're talking about Bonto Capi. When you're describing Deseo, <laughs> big guy <laughs> rounded into his drink, likes the girls. They're pretty, they're pretty yeah. close, which makes sense. It's pretty much the same, wasn't it? Yeah. The coffee was the same, well, but um, it's same, same. That's what the Serrani are to an extent. I mean, I'm not saying the bent side, but the men are. At least the men we see, the characters we see, they're all not that far from Bonto or Jiro. Uh, G- uh, what is it? G- the, the Bonto's Giro. middle brother, Jiro. Yeah, Jiro. Anasati. Um, I, I disagree, I think. Um, honestly, they all just... I think that's them in particular. Um, and it goes to show their mindset the way he named the dogs. And I think that's why they put that in. That sort yeah. of brute mentality, savageness. You know, what do you name the dog? Like I, slaughter, I, <laughs> murder dog, or whatever. Um, right. he, he, I, I think they did that, over the though. top sort of macho the, names. I, I think they did that though to make somebody more clearly the bad guy, even within the context of the culture they're in that there's something morally mm-hmm. wrong with this person, not just because they're Sarani, and I'm sorry, the Sarani are mor- morally wrong at this point. And having somebody who's worse than what we already see is bad from our standpoint where slavery and just the, the reckless, you know, the, 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 the carefree killing of people and ordering deaths of people like you know the way that they treat anybody below them it they all do that our hero mara does that she orders eight men dead because they overheard the wrong words come said by a choja queen last book mara is a sick evil individual by our morality in this world today yeah but she's willing to learn and 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 she's and learning though, yeah she she's a, she's a she's a figure of her culture she's a manifestation of her culture and what she's been brought yeah. up with but she's she's wise and intelligent enough to start to see the cracks and the issues that there actually are within her society so she's and that she's, started last book yeah exactly it really really progresses in this book especially with um kevin being kind of like a vehicle for that you know so catalyst yeah catalyst that's the word i was trying to pick um i I appreciate that the emperor is actually pretty progressive in the end yeah Um, each and is at least open-minded yeah you know that's why i would disagree with you we do see men who are catching on and going things are changing we need to adapt we do see that within several characters, you know, within the... Uh, no, really, within Wabi. That's why I was saying, like, well, the no. and I, that are... But their mindset are, is so locked are, into alpha male mode that... Yeah, know, they're, they're, they're real caricatures of what they're trying to represent. Um, but then you've got the likes of the Shinzawa, is that what pronunciation? 
um, Hokkaido and his away. dad and Kasumi. I love, I love and they, Oceans Away. I love them. I would, I would, I think out of all of them, if I was one of the characters in that land, I would probably want to marry Okanu. <laughs> That's fair. So just sweetheart. Well, he's Kano's just great. Oh, he's I amazing. Thought, I thought Kasumi. I thought Kasumi was great, but Hokanu is. I, I'd oh, forgotten. He, That's another thing I'd forgotten. How much of a part Hokanu takes oh, in this book? He's incredible. He's so good, and he's not even in it for large parts of the book at all. No, like he's right. He's particularly a minor character, but he's such a memorable character, and he's such a good character. You know. We know from Magician that he basically stops Pug getting um, killed because he had an accident. Right. And kind he's of there the for universe. no use. Yeah, exactly. And also, in turn, created the ripple effect that created the Imperial Games, but however, you know, the butterfly effect. But um, Unforeseen he, he, consequence. Yeah, exactly. So, Except, we know... You know... <clears throat> Yeah, go ahead. So I think the, I think in the long run, the Imperial Games do continue on to improve Sarani society because it was for the most of them it was the first real smack in the face that it's even possible what you were they were doing was wrong. Um, if somebody comes here from another universe, you know, and then causes a big ruckus and tells us that the way we're doing our culture here in the United States, you know, and the earth in general is wrong. Nobody's going to appreciate it unless we end up seeing that. Yeah. Maybe he has a reason for saying we're wrong in the way we're doing things. I mean, stranger you know? in a strange land. Yeah. I just had pop into my head the day the earth stood still, you know, it, that was a bit more peaceful way of going about it. For the most part, yeah. Well, yeah, a lot more peaceful. Only tanks and you know, soldiers got shot. But well, that makes it okay. Been a long time since. <laughs> well, well, when you're when they're shooting at the robot, that, that, that's that, that's just a response. But you know, comparatively, you've got more violence in this. You know, but you know, it, it, it's I, I really do kind of see Pug Malamber as you know that that in that role that same role that, that that kind of a messenger like hey you really need to look at your society and give it another think and some had already been leaning that way like the shinzo Wai. um otherwise they wouldn't have been well maybe not i think they're the, the way they they started leaning that way probably just as much from you know, trying to bring peace back around with the Blue Wheel Party and that whole yeah. plot. And we know um, that they were trying something different from reading it, what they were up to in Magician. Right. So yeah. we know what's going on with them as we're reading Servant because the reality is a Servant actually starts halfway through Magician. So, yeah. and it finishes at the end of, well, just after darkness that's setting on so that what this one book basically takes in the history of half of the first of the trilogy to the end of the trilogy which is a lot of that's a large expanse of time within the universe um of yeah. mid chemia that's a but good when decade you look at, in this book yeah i think it's a good so, five or six years that take place um at least, at least ten, 10 years. years. Is it ten? No, it's. I think it's ten. Cause well, it's, um, Ar A A A Ayaki I think was by the ten. Or almost nine. He was nine. She talked about it being in just ten years. Ten years ago, I had thirty-seven, or she had thirty-seven troops. Ten years later, she has like two, three thousand. I think she said yeah. in her thoughts. So, so that's how long it's been done. since her, her she became Lady of the Akoma. Yeah. So I think it's only and about eight years. Just so about yeah, eight to nine years since um Okay. Kaki's dead and getting up goes to go get her slaves. So it's it's it shows you how long herself and Kevin were together in a relationship and God 
the, their their love story wasn't. I I love I love a good romance. So this I think I... was the first fantasy I ever read that had a romance that I can remember, like a a well done romance. I mean, the Bulgarian yeah, has like a... those two getting together, but I never really thought of that as like a, a serious romance when I was reading it, even as a teenager. Um, yeah, but I, I've always yeah, liked the Kevin there's romance in the bitter bind, the bitter bind. Yeah, mm. there's a bit of a romance in the bitter bind saga. Um, okay, but it's not as not like that's over three books whereas this is a proper relationship romance in one book compared to that and even in the bitter bind it's not it's nowhere like what you get in this book this is this is brilliant you're, you're very invested in their relationship and you can feel how much they both love each other and and that's all back to the the writing and the quality of the writing being able to actually portray what the feeling and the emotion um so kudos to johnny Wirtz. <laughs> yeah and I, I, I love the fact that they uh they have a, a habit in this book of doing things very abruptly um lord deseo is killed off screen very abruptly um you you get to say you know and, and that's done very and kevin being taken away very abruptly I mean, it, it all happens very, very quickly, and it's not always shown in full depth. And that was a surprise for me, but it was a good one because that's what life feels like sometimes. Sometimes those yeah. sort of things do happen abruptly and just pop out of nowhere. And I love that they, yeah. they sort of built that into this book. And, and you feel it in different points. I like, yeah, the, the romance I think is really good. Uh, yeah. it, it It's better than... Yeah, I'll say every romance in the Wheel of Time. Glenn had to step out. He's having some Wi-Fi issues, so I'm going to go ahead and take over. Um, I think question six was, um, at your current point in life, how has your life experience changed your viewpoint on the story from the first time you read? Well, surprisingly, after I'd first read it, um, I ended up becoming a woman in a position that is very male dominated. So I ended up mm. as retail management. Um, so it was a real man's game, as you mm. can imagine. Yeah. Uh, and I'm a highly sensitive woman. So <laughs> uh, it, was, it was interesting. I, I've done that. I did that for about 15 years now, almost 20 years. Um. So in a way, I can relate to the struggles of being a woman for Mara. So at the time of reading it initially, like it was a completely different perspective. It was completely different for me. But now having been in a management position, being a woman trying to um, take charge and be, you know, the person who has to organize things and and deal with staff and and a lot of male staff. Um, I can kind of relate to her struggles. Um, and I think rereading it this time, it kind of gives me more respect for her because of how she deals with everything, how she handles it and um, the game that she plays to be accepted within that, that world that she's in. Because she does appear to be the only main female of power within the entire um, clan, other than the regent of the Zacatecas, um, yeah. who's awesome. Yeah. Other than the regent, yeah, not really any female presence. No, no. So she's she's really in a very very male dominated world, and it's very hard for women to get understood, respected, um, listened to in a world that's very male dominated. Um, so I think that just gave me just that little bit more of a respect for the character, um, which I think, you know, is unique in that sense. Um, 
So, yeah, I no, I 100% agree. And I could see we're going into the sort of business dynamic you went into where this would resonate a little differently with you now. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, uh, irregardless of times, there are a lot of men who don't like taking orders. So I, I can see where that's an issue. And even 20, almost 20 years ago, they, they didn't like taking. Yeah. It'd be really worse. Or, so. You know, and to be fair, like there were other female managers within my job. Um, and there was a lot of very strong female managers mm. in my job. And I think my boss himself actually had this penchant for seeing the kind of um, ability that women actually have and what they can actually bring to the role that men can't. And he seemed to lean towards hiring more women for those roles than he ever did for men. Um, I think it's also because when you've got up to 100 staff, you need people who are a little bit more sympathetic, who can be a bit more understanding in ways that some male managers can't be. But also in the environment, it, because we were just one business in an area, in an environment with an awful lot of other businesses, and most of them were male run, um, it kind of gave us a different edge, I think. And also being a books being a bookstore, it uh, I think it like suited us better. Perfect job. So. I'm like, yeah, I've been married so long that I am so used to taking orders. I don't even pretend like I'm in charge anymore. So I'd be yeah. like the perfect employee. Just <laughs> point me somewhere and tell me what to do. I'm good. Yeah, exactly. Here comes Glenn. Hey, you're back. Hey. Welcome Sorry back. Sorry about that. The router okay. went out or something. I did a reset on the router and then did a complete restart on my computer. And one of the two worked. So I, I think my life experience has led to me just being a bit, you know, a, a bit more firm in my belief that the Sarani need to change. You know, and uh, I, I feel that now more than I remember feeling it on previous reads. I don't remember the Sarani upsetting me as much as they did rereading the Rift War saga in this trilogy um, when I read it before than it did this year. I don't, I, I'm assuming that just, I, I couldn't put my finger on what it is, you know, what's changed about me or what exactly, but I'm become more strident in the, the belief that they need to change their ways, that they're a stagnant civilization. I, I think that was outlined pretty well on Magician. Um, definitely a I theme I picked up the, the word first used. time I read Magician. So, yeah. I mean, you know, all of Magician. For those that had the book split up. Right. You know, and that split up kind of almost makes sense if you're going to read Magician Apprentice, Daughter of the Empire, Magician Master, Dark or Silverthorn, uh, A Darkness of Sethanon, and then this book, Servant of the Empire. Well, I, That's I the think way I would do it if I was going to do it chronologically. If they were going to do a TV series, they'd have to intertwine. Uh, her story with uh, pugs. Next question for you, both of you. This one, Bill, has got going to have answers, I'm sure. What are there any elements of this book that clash with today's social and or political climates, and that are problematic for you? And has the story aged well from when it came out? I'd say yes, it's aged well. As for problematic, I mean, slavery, we can all agree that's pretty freaking it's horrible. It's in the book, too. Yeah. So, unfortunately, it's very real, yeah. you know. A and lot of sexism still. As horrible as it is, um, in a way, you kind of need stories 
bring up and discuss slavery, show why it's wrong. And the only way to do that, obviously, is to actually have it portrayed. Oh, and as much as I hate slavery, in a way, it's kind of a necessity to get the moral across to the reader that slavery is wrong. And I think this book, by the end, does that very well because we have Mara actually turn around and say that she hopes that one day all the slaves will be free. So, um, and I think that moral really does come true. And we live in a society nowadays that is so political. Everywhere there is an opinion. Um, people can be very naive. Um, they believe anything. Um, so yes, literally, that is for sure. So mm. important because that's where the real truth of some things can actually come true and remind people that actually some of the stuff that you read on the internet is false and what you can read and learn through a book is actually something magical um, than Danny XY95 blue tick mark you know what I mean so yeah um and it's the same with domestic abuse we all know that domestic abuse is a horrible thing but we see the side effects that it has on Mara in the book from the first book like she's so afraid of men and being touched by yeah, a man she was, at the yeah. start you know when it doesn't help that Kevin takes her by the goddamn neck you know what I mean which I think just and it's like, he's almost like why did they have him do that because oh, it doesn't balance well with how gentle he is with her if he had been a little bit more gentle or than he was then maybe she would have seen quite earlier that not all men are the same but it does you know but you can see the mental side effects and the, the, of the abuse that Bunakapi had on her um, and I yeah. think that's something that also is really good because not a lot of books actually do that not a lot of novels actually make you feel what a woman can actually feel when she has been psychologically abused by her partner um, and I think it was, although I probably prefer if it wasn't, it's a necessary evil in this book. Um, if it even just highlights one person or 10 people behavior can do to somebody. And this is how damaging it is. Sorry, I yeah. went on a tangent, didn't oh, I? No, no, that's good. <laughs> You're not That's wrong. Good. You're 100 percent right, yeah. and uh, you know, I I think at that I, moment when he does grab her by the neck, it it's it's not so much male against female in his mind. It, it's owner against slave, and he needs yeah. her to know that he's more than just a slave, and that you know it's he's only by his forgiveness and his mercy that she's even walking around, which shows her there is more to it. Um, the, the I love the I have... fact that it shows uh, a flaw within the Sarani society. Here she is. She's got the marks on her neck. She can't say anything to anybody because they'll think her weak. They're going to see the marks on her neck and know it anyway. But if nobody acknowledges it, it didn't happen. Yeah. Which is a fatal flaw within their entire society. Uh, there are no knives here. I see no knives. But the reality is, is that's something that happens every day in our own society. People can see that there is an abuse that's going on and turn a blind eye, you know? Yeah. And, and that's that's why the likes of domestic abuse is allowed to continue because too many people turn blind eyes. And that is one of the biggest flaws of the Sarani culture. They just turn the blind eye to everything. Sometimes you need it, like in the case of Kevin with a sword, but you know, in the likes of something like this, when someone has been threatened in such a way and they know it, 
that is not when a blind eye should be turned. Right. No, I, I don't have anything to add to that. She she covered it all. You guys, both of you covered it all. Um, the big one that you know I would have mentioned right off the bat, obviously, it was the slavery. You know, there's still it's still a really sexist society that they live yeah. in. You know, and, and I think Mari even says it this book that you know, it, it, the only reason why she's got anything is because she's the ruling lady. You yeah, that's way with anything. You know, if she wasn't ruling, she would be. Well, actually, would I would like Go to ahead. add one sure. character flaw that really got on my nerves. And it's a stereotype. And it was having the fiery red head character. The character <laughs> who's so fiery and goes berserk and is a red head. And obviously, he's, to me, it just felt like a trope that has been done and hit off one too many wall. And as much as I love Kevin as a character, see that really got on my nerves. My 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 <laughs> dad and my sister are both redheads. Lived with them redhead. for a good chunk of my life. And Kevin didn't seem all that different from what I lived with. <laughs> so are you preaching to a I, redhead from Iowa? About redheads? I'm just just saying, I, I, I living <laughs> with two redheads, this redhead was not anything strange and bizarre to me. This that was that was a lot like my dad. Oh, I know loads of redheads. So, I as as Bill pointed out I'm from Ireland, so I do know oh, quite a lot of redheads. And I can tell you they're not all like that. They're not oh, all like, like that. I know, I know redheads that aren't, but woman about it's, redheads, right? That that's one of those stereotypes that actually has a reason for it, <laughs> because a lot <laughs> of redheads end up being fiery personalities and just yeah. And yet, from my own experience, the ones that have the fiery is tempers are actually the ones who are quite short. So uh <laughs> that makes sense. That's my dad and my sister. Yep. That's my dad and my sister. That makes sense. That's just short people are I'm not I just I like one of my best friends is a lot I'm shorter chill. than me and oh my god, I don't know anyone who has a fiery temper temper like her. I wouldn't um, get on the wrong side of her. <laughs> would you gents and ladies recommend this book to younger readers today? more mature readers today or both 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 yeah i think both yeah. yeah i i would hesitate to hand this to someone who was under 16. i would hand it to their parents perhaps and let their parents read it first but and let them make that decision just because of certain scenes between <laughs> kevin and mara you know, well, I was reading Anne Rice when I was 12 and 13, so you'd be surprised what 13, 14 year olds are actually reading. I um, was reading a lot of Dune and uh, Thomas Covenant, The Chronicles of Thomas okay. Covenant. I was um, reading Lady Chatterley's of, Lover. Um, I, I was reading adult stuff at the time, exactly. too. A lot of Robert when, Heinlein, Time Enough for it, Love. Oh, my God. But when you think about her, but I'm saying somebody else's kid. I'm not going to hand somebody uh, like, yeah, else's kid who's 15 or younger. Well, <laughs> as, a, as a bookseller, yeah. um, as someone who has worked in bookselling for almost 10 years, um, we didn't have what teenagers have today when we were growing up. So reading adult novels was what we did as teenagers. Um. It, what that was that was what we had you know if we were 13 reading an on rice, on rice novel like cry to heaven which you know was very raunchy that was a norm it, if you were yeah. 14 reading a jack london novel that was that was normal you know um because we didn't have what they have today the teenage book industry 
only really took off in the latter half of the 90s. And the 90s was when it was really, really born. It really didn't exist mm-hmm. before then. Very few books did. You had your children's book. You had your adult's book. There was not right. really an area between. Um, and we learned a lot about that in ch- study- when I was studying children's literature as well. Uh, teenagers have today, gosh, our reading habits probably would have been completely different if we had yeah. what they have. I don't know. I might have skipped the um, YA stuff, you know, from, you know, I would have probably turned 12, 13, skipped the YA stuff and gone straight on, you know, continued on reading the adult stuff that I was reading when I was a wee kid. I've, I've read a um, lot of, I've read a lot of young adult stuff as an adult, and I would have loved a lot of that I've stuff read some. As, a, as a young adult, but mainly the fantasy type stuff. Yeah. There is some, some of the it other ones stuff that I with. like book for Claire, for example. Yeah, the, there the are Sandra some of those... Claire, for example. I would have loved to have had her in the 90s. There are some yeah. books that are considered YA now, like the Dragon Heart or the Harper Hall of Pern series by Anne McCaffrey. Mm-hmm. That was actually my introduction to Pern, and I just did a big mega reread, and there was some that I had never read, so first time read, but this big read through of all of Pern. And to this day, at the age of 50, my favorite Pern stuff is the Harper Hall of Pern, which is listed as, you know, would be listed as YA because it's about a 15-year-old kid. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I know a younger me would have just skipped all that because that's what all my peers were reading. They're not reading at the level I was reading, so... I would never read what they were reading. It felt like I was reading my class, you know, my school stuff. And I didn't do that. Mr. Look at my big brain. I'm going to outread everyone. That's how I was (laughs) when I was a kid. The stuff that I I would read. I always remember first year of secondary school when we did Romeo and Juliet and I got really into Shakespeare. And I started buying the the Penguin popular classics every week with my pocket money because they were only a pound. And uh, I'd we be did. going in and telling my English teacher, oh, I've just read Midsummer's Night's Dream and I did this. And then one day there was a knock on, one, on my classroom door um, during, I think it was maths or Irish or something. And my English teacher was outside and asked, could she speak to me? And I got called outside and there she was with her copy of the complete works of Shakespeare for me to take a I could read. Oh, nice. Yeah. That is amazing. I wrote my first play when I was 14. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, nerds so, yeah, of the world we... unite. <laughs> yes. Bill, you agree? All ages? Yeah. 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 I mean, well, most, mostly all ages. But... Given what they have access to on their phone alone. They've seen and heard so much worse than what's in this book. I know. Realistically, I know, but... read on if you like. I'd say if it's anyone under 13, I wouldn't give it to them. Anyone over 13. Okay. Okay. I mean, I once had a, a customer want to buy the Hunger Games for her nine, ten-year-old daughter because she heard all about it, and I said, please don't. She's too young for it. Yeah. No, she's not ready for that yet. Yeah, um, and they were like, "Oh, but she really wants to read." And I was like, "Look, it's full of blood. It's full of gore. It's but it's just, it's horrific." I was like, "She's she's really? just too." Bad. I did, did not yeah. know that. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, go around murder. It's a bit like, it's basically Squid Game, isn't it? <laughs> only the only one of them can wait. Uh, See, I've only ever seen the movies. Everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, for all the blood they didn't show in the movies, they absolutely described in the books. Yeah. So Rue's death is way worse in the book than it is on screen. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Oh, the themes are pretty. Breaking. Yeah, they're they're pretty rough, especially for yeah. You know, the age group. Uh, it's kids yeah. killing kids. You know. Yeah. Battle royale it's style. Pretty- it's rough. Yeah. Anything Maybe else anybody wants to bring up about anything you want to bring up about serving the empire? Or... 
I am Definitely really looking forward to book three. Thought everybody should read it. I'm looking okay. forward to you looking forward uh, to it. I can't wait for you to read it. I know. <laughs> I can't wait for you to read it. Well, I'll have, you'll have, to, you'll have to message me your email <laughs> or message oh. me your impression of it. I will. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Nineves today. Thank you for joining us today, tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming on, spending some time talking with us. I know it's kind of late for you over there, so you got lucky it's this channel. It's early in the day. But thank <laughs> you for joining us. Thank you guys at home for watching. Please leave us a like, a comment. Me. Subscribe. No, um, just, just want to say thanks so much for having me on again, guys. I thoroughly enjoy chatting away about books. Books are my life, so it's lovely to be able to just yap away and talk about what I love so much with people awesome. who understand the same. So thank you Glad both for you what you are doing. Yeah, hopefully we can have you back. Um, yeah, well, let's figure out what, what are rereads of books I've read that you've read that we can chat together about. Let's we'll get our list. Get the list. <laughs> Thank you at home for watching. Please leave a like, a subscribe, and leave some comments while you're at it. And come back in three weeks when we do Mistress of the Empire by Feist and Words again. We'll be wrapping it up. Thanks for watching. And hey, don't forget to be awesome. See ya.